And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Remembrance Day was first observed in 1919 throughout the British Commonwealth. It was originally called Armistice Day to commemorate Armistice Agreement that ended the First World War on Monday, November 11, 1918 at 11 a.m. on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. On today's Open Connection, we feature a First Nations veteran. Why sim gigat sagamhana kubo wuxen? Got some mills at a teeth clean at a Mike D'Angelo de Wayu. Gingola te wawaku, terrace de wawzagu. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike D'Angeli. I'm of the Nishka, Simshian, and Thinget peoples. My Nishka name is Gatsamil. I'm from the house of Beit Nech, in the village of Gingolith. Uh, on my Simshian side, I'm from the village of Kitsimkalem and Metlakatla, Alaska. My Clinket name is Teeth Clean. I'm from the Tantaquan Hoots, Tequidi, the Tongass tribe people, uh, just outside of Ketchikan, Alaska. So as far as being an Aboriginal veteran, I served 10 years as a U.S. Army Airborne Ranger. Uh, the reason I did is I come from a long um, history of, of service people. Uh, my great-grandfather was part of the Alaska Territorial Guard before Alaska was even a state, uh, guarding and protecting the borders and, and protecting the lands. Uh, my great, or my grandfather, his, uh, my great-grandfather's son, Reggie D'Angeli, uh, who's also Gingolith and, and uh, is Nishka, Klinkit, and Tsitsawit, uh, was uh, in World War II. He actually lied about his age to join the military. It was his way of escaping residential school. Uh, and he ended up uh, sharing so many stories with us, but the one thing that he really talked about was uh, the amount of racism that he, he endured while in the service during World War II. Um, he felt the pa you know, his patriotic duty, but also a, a sense of protecting the lands just because of uh, the aggressors at the time uh, were, were talking about world domination. And uh, so he, like I said, lied about his age and uh, joined up and was, ended up being part of the Philippine campaign. And because he grew up on boats and, and was a fisherman all, you know, all his life when he wasn't in residential school, uh, they made him, uh, at the time, they, he got promoted up because he knew about, more about the boats than the Gumsiwa. Uh, and that was when the army still had a boat squadrons, still had boat squadrons. And uh, he uh, talked about when he joined, they said, well, there's no Indians. There's no Indians anymore. You're either black or you're white. And that really upset him. You know, and, and they said, D'Angelo, that sounds Italian. We're going to put you with the white guys, you know, and, and he, that pissed him off even more. Uh, but, you know, he saw how the, how the black guys were being treated and how they weren't even able to defend their country, how they weren't put, they were put in jobs that were ridiculous. You know, they, they were at the time, they believed black people couldn't see in the dark and all sorts of other crazy things. So they made them dishwashers and laundry people, you know, and just all sorts of crazy stuff. So when he made it to the Philippines, uh, he was leading the boat squadrons and, and uh, got to the point where he rose up in the ranks very quick. Uh, he then became uh, a drill sergeant. Uh, so he was training troops while he was there. And then uh, they were fighting against the Japanese insurgents. And uh, with Gramps, he, uh, he felt a real kinship to the Filipino people. He always talked very highly of them in his, in it, throughout the rest of his life and talked to us about them. How they're just like us. They're dealing with colonialism. They were dealing with the crazies of other governments coming and telling them what they should and shouldn't be doing in their own territory. So he felt a real kinship with them. And uh, because of that kinship and his, and his love and support of them, uh, when MacArthur left, you know, and when uh, things got pretty hectic down in the South Pacific, and MacArthur did his big giant speech, I shall return, after he was, you know, had to basically pull back and retreat. My grandfather, uh, among a number of other uh, US service people, stayed behind and helped fight uh, against the Japanese insurgents with the, with the Filipino people. And so because of that, my, my grandfather was, was uh, injured quite a bit and some of those injuries even sustained even after his, he, he was done with combat. 
but uh, he made it home safe and sound. Uh, I was a drill sergeant for a little bit longer and then uh, was stationed all over the place and even down in Florida for a bit where, you know, he uh, enjoyed himself and loved, loved being down there, but he really missed home. So he got out of the service and, and switched over to the Coast Guard to finish up the rest of his duty. So he could move back to Southeast and come take his boat that he built with his brothers, the Nellie B with Max Haynes and, and Morris Haldane and, and other brothers on the Alaska side, they, they fished out of, out of their seine boat and they would come up and go to Gingolith and visit family over that way where he eventually married my grandmother. His son, William Vernon D'Angeli, my Uncle Bill, grew up hearing the same thing from his father, you know, about how you come from a line of, of land protectors, you come from a line of people that defend our country, that defend our, our ways of being, even though we're being assimilated and forced into colonialism, there were still many that, you know, at the time that was really the belief that we needed to be part of this, the solution. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. Recruit training, or commonly known as basic training or boot camp, refers to the initial instructions of new military personnel. Recruit training is physically and psychologically intensive process, which re-socializes its subject for the demands of military employment. Let us return to the conversation with Mike D'Angeli. I had one more year of high school. I was ahead of my class. I was ahead of my grade. Uh, so I joined the US Army. I had to get my mom to sign. I'm the only child. And uh, for those of you who, don't, who know my mom, Arlene Roberts, uh, needless to say, uh, it, was, it, was, it took a lot of talking her into it. She knew I was gonna do it no matter what, but she'd rather support me than work against me. And uh, she, she begrudgingly signed. And so I did my uh, basic training going into my high school, my senior year, my grade 12, uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia. Talk about a reality check. Holy crumbs. I was, uh, I, I wasn't heavy, I wasn't fat, I was heavy set, and I was out of shape, and boy, did they ever change all of that. I remember being in the MEP station, which is the processing station, in Fort Benning, Georgia, and they get you up at five o'clock, no matter what. 4.30, five o'clock, and you go eat chow, and you're basically waiting to get, figure out where you're gonna be put to next. It is a ugly place to, it's like purgatory. And you got people yelling at you, you gotta get your gear, you get, you get your hair cut. See, and I had long hair, so, you know, being an Indian kid, you know, they, they made fun of that, you know, and, and even got more, had I known, I would like, get a haircut before, that way you're not getting, you know, this more, this flashlight on you. And so I called, I called home, and I was crying, I was worried. I'm like 17, never been outside of, you know, I mean, I've been through BC and Washington and Alaska, but never, never that far from home by myself. And uh, I call home, I talk to my mom. Of course, my mom's all like, well, find a way, you know, you made your commitment, but you know, if this isn't what you want to do. And my grandfather got on, he's like, forget that noise. Of course, he said something else. You're a man now, you made a decision. You've given your word. You need to follow through your commitment. And, uh, and he's like, if you're crying, stop crying. If you're scared, stop being scared. Hide that. D put it deep inside you. And so as an adult and as somebody, you know, hindsight's 2020, I look at and think about what he was sharing. He was sharing not only stuff what he did in military, but stuff that he went through in residential school. You know, and, and he said, don't volunteer for anything. He goes, I know you're big, but people are, go you know, try to, try to blend in with the rest of the green behind you. And that was the best advice I got. Because he wanted me to learn. Learn before you act, because you don't want to be the example of what not to do. So I learned so much, and that was three and a half months. So basically from uh, May till I got home mid-August. And a completely changed, individual. Uh, my mom was really worried because when I sat down, I was just scarfing as fast as I could. You know, she had made me count, Michael, count 20 times with each bite, you know, and then I still was eating fast. She got like 50 times. And uh, 
you know, I, uh, I took that year to um, really get to know myself better. I, I had shed a ton of weight. I was in some one of the best shapes I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, I continued to train. I continued to. Uh, I was. I didn't have to. I. Uh, it wasn't mandatory, but I, I continued. I started training with the National Art Guard unit in Ketchikan, just so that I could uh, understand a little bit more. Because the basic training just basically shows you: here's a rifle. Here's how you clean it. Here's how you march. Now you're ready for combat. You don't know anything, right? That's like middle school. <laughs> so, or, or high school, getting ready for college. Now the, the two don't relate, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I trained, I, I, I kept, I asked a million and one questions. Uh, I got in, I, I did whatever kind of training I could do as far as physical training and uh, just got into really great shape. And then after graduation from high school, I also had that discipline. And so during that time as well, that, that high school year, my uncle Bill passed away. He was my absolute hero. And one of the last conversations, cause I told him I'm doing okay. I could be doing a little better. And I was excited about trying wrestling and other sports and physic focusing on my, the physicality of, of being a strong young man. And he kept pushing the, the strongest muscle in your brain is your brain, you know? And uh, when, he, when he passed, I, I quit all my sports because I just wanted to focus and, and I actually graduated a, a whole semester before than I was supposed to. Uh, I ended up staying and, and getting the more the extra credits that I didn't need, but I, I graduated with a 4.0. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Established as Camp Benning in 1918 on an old plantation site in Georgia, Fort Benning Army Post now supports more than 120,000 active military, retirees, and civilian employees on a daily basis. Let us return to the conversation with Mike Delangeli. And then uh, went to Fort Benning to do advanced infantry school. And some of the people weren't ready for that, but I was mentally and physically and spiritually ready. I actually went and I uh, was really grateful. I had a, um, a medicine woman that lived in the, in the town that was a, a A&D counselor, alcohol and drug counselor, that worked with my mom. And uh, she helped prepare me spiritually. And uh, so I was really grateful I had all of that. I had all of that, that when I joined, or when I went back to do my advanced infantry school, I was, I was, I was sharp. I was the sharpest tool that in the, in the, you know, that you could have. And, I didn't have any problems, not like the last time where I was scared and wide-eyed and, oh, I don't want to mess up. You know, of course, I, I would say other things, the F word it up, but uh, I, I had it and I, and I had no problems. Um, I had signed on to, to go airborne and this particular drill sergeant who uh, was a ranger used to sit and wake me up, be the first one to wake me up in my ear saying, I won't say what exactly what he said, but he'd say, wake. It's, it's wakey, wakey time there, you know, sweetie. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a wussy for not joining the Rangers. And uh, he would say that almost every day because he knew I was going airborne. And, and I think he saw something in me that uh, he figured that I could handle, handle that Ranger training. So uh, I signed on with the Rangers after airborne. Uh, finished finished uh, infantry school, top of my class. Did airborne school, not, you know, no problem. It's, the scariest thing was, was the heights, and I was afraid of heights, but I was grateful that I was able to kind of take that on. And then Ranger School, which was, uh, there were, I would say in the, somewhere in the neighborhood between three and 500 that started. Uh, 500 right away, and then they, of course they, they break you off, but uh, out, of the, out of all those students, I think there was less than 50 of us that graduated. Uh, I served a, a stint with the Rangers, I served a stint with the 82nd Airborne. I served uh, some time up uh, as part of the training cadre in, in uh, Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska. It's funny, they keep sending me, they kept sending me to hot places, being from the north, being from uh, southeast Alaska, northern BC, they kept sending me to the hottest places on earth. I have four tours of combat, some of which I can talk about, some of which I can't. Some of which is, uh, the stuff I can't talk about is apparently on, on the History Channel, which I thought was interesting. I was sitting back watching one Remembrance Day and I saw my unit repelling onto a building in, in Colombia. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, but, uh, you know, th those kind of crazy things. The, th the things about the Rangers and the things that I really enjoyed about it 
was the um, the Brotherhood. I enjoyed really not knowing where, where the training was going to take us. It was a lot of guesswork. Now, as an, a much older, or excuse me, senior gentleman, uh, I, I like having, I like knowing what the plan is. I like being in the know. Uh, but I served 10 years, and then I switched out. Uh, after after being in the regular army, I switched over to the National Guard to uh, get my um, to get my college degree in history. Uh, and then uh, there was still lots of racism. Alaska Army National Guard at the time wasn't promoting First Nations, and I got into it with some some racist people. Turned out that with me, I I I didn't mean to, but I slapped them uh, for some racist crap that they said, and uh, I was told that I could go to Fort. Uh, to um, geez, I'm forgetting the military prison. But anyway, I could have gone to the military prison, breaking big rocks into small rocks, and uh, I ended up getting a, a civilian lawyer who who brought out the racism. Who talked about the racism. So I ended up. Uh, they offered. I wanted special forces. They offered special forces. They offered some other training. Uh, I, officer candidate school, or, or uh, to become a, a, a second lieutenant. I was I was torn between that and and. Uh, becoming a um, uh, warrant officer. Um, and I thought seriously, sincere, you know, seriously about it and, and sincerely about it. And then 10 years in, I was like, 10 years didn't seem like nothing at the time, but it was a lot of time. That's a lot of time to put into something. And 10 more years and I can get a full retirement, you know, but I was in my, I was 27, 28. Who thinks about that stuff in their 20s, right? But I also didn't want to put up with 10 more years of, of BS. And I got out. My brother cousins joined the US Navy and United States Marines. Uh, and we're, you know, all of us were, were wanting to do those kind of things that our grandfather did, that our Uncle Bill did, that our great grandfather did. And that was a part of that reason for doing that. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Military service is difficult, demanding, and dangerous. But returning to civilian life also poses challenges for men and women who have served in the armed forces. In this final segment of Open Connection, Mike Delangeli shares how he was able to adapt to a civilian life. To really process everything and think about the best situation through it all. So that's the one thing I got from the military that I'm really grateful for. Would I have found it eventually in life? I probably would have. You know, and the other things people ask me, you have, I have two grown sons and another, you know, son that's a one-year-old. Would I ever support them in joining the military? The one thing is I've been really honest about with my sons is I've given enough time and spilt enough blood of myself and sacrificed enough of myself that they don't need to do that. And I say that even to, for my nieces and nephews. I got ne nephews and nieces that have joined the military. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of their service. Their call, they're wanting to, to answer that call of duty for our indigenous people. If you're going to join, get everything in writing. Get it, you know, think about what, why you're joining and think about getting the best education that you have. You know, and I think about my, my brother, cousin Frank, who joined the Navy, became an IT specialist in the military. You know, and he now has his, a company that where he makes a ridiculous amount of money. And my, uh, my other brother, brother, cousin, I, he was a Marine. We both chose action in our young life and, and we're not really using any of the stuff that we learned in the military as far as, uh, you know, the, the, that, that stuff, but we're really focusing on uh, the leadership, you know? And so there's, there's ways of being able to gain so much from it. So I say that to our young people who are interested in the military or think about it as a way out. It was a way out for me. Coming from, you know, a single mom who I was really worried about her financial finances and thinking, well, if I do this, this will take some of it off. Um, I've since potlatched my mom and apologized. I'm saying that now on camera because I, uh, if you know my mom, you, you, you know how strong she is and you know how vocal she can be. Uh, I wonder where I get it, uh, but uh, I've, I've thanked her and I've apologized for her signing on that dotted line because she did it a lot out of faith and I'm really grateful for that because it, it allowed me to spread my wings and see the world uh, in a different way that I probably wouldn't have seen in, in another way. 
Um, I always tell people I got to see the most beautiful places on earth, but how ugly as human beings we treat it, each other and the places that, uh, that we go to. And so I really hope and pray for, for kindness and peace. I know in reality, it's, we're always gonna have conflict. And it's not the soldier's job to, and it's not that they're automatons, but it's, it's the leadership. You know, we just had elections. Think about that when you're voting. If you're not voting, why not? That's part of, I understand there's this whole critical thought of, of buying into colonialism. We're surrounded, we're, we're entrenched in colonialism. And so how can we be a part of, you know, how could we fix, how can we decolonize? Well, part of it is we need to give that space. So we need to think about the people that have given that space and time for us to be considered citizens, to be considered human beings, to be considered to, to worthy to vote, to have a voice. And so part of that is we need to exercise what those ancestors have fought for. We need to think about that. We need, if we're tired of the, the crap that's going on in the world, we need to be part, part of the situation. We need to start demanding sitting at the table. And so that's part of, part of what I've seen my journey and throughout my life and being an ex-military. 10 years, four tours, I've sacrificed a lot. I've, I've missed part of my son's growing up, you know, and, and, and that I've had to apologize them both publicly and privately. You know, my son's now, my 28 year old's like, dad, I'm over it. You need to get over it. He just said that when we're working on the murder and missing women totem pole and here in Terrace. But that's always something I'm gonna hold on to because it's something that I wish I would have done better as, as a adult, as a man, as a father. It doesn't mean you have to join the military, but community service is so important. Community service could be going to help the Friendship Center, could be going and helping your, your local First Nations government could be doing a call out for the city government when they're saying they're needing something to happen. Could be helping getting groceries for elders that shouldn't be going out in this time of COVID or for families. You know, thinking about those things and thinking of more than in yourself is what community service is. And I see a lot of it. I see a lot of amazing things happening up and down the coast. I have hope and faith that our people and non-First Nations people, we gotta share this place. None of us are willing to give it up or leave. So we gotta find a compromise. We gotta find an ability to be kind to each other. And to me, that is what Remembrance Day is about. It's remembering those who sacrificed so that we could be here talking right now. You know, that I could be talking to you guys, that I have that luxury of being able to be here, the time and space to be able to talk to you guys out there. I'm very grateful. I'm thankful for where I'm at. I'm thankful for all the hard times and the the difficulties being overseas and being in places that I'm just very grateful that I'm home. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.